of opportunities. And I'm really excited because today we're actually going to go have an in-depth discussion with a gaming channel. But the lessons that he's learned along the way can really help you succeed on YouTube. Because fundamentally, when we create content for YouTube, we really want to put our passion into content that engages a viewer for them not only to view, but to come back and watch more. And if you are struggling on YouTube or if you feel plateaued, or even if you're really excelling on YouTube, you got to stick around because this is one of the best uh, interviews I can tell you that I can have on my channel to help you be successful because he's literally done things in a way that will make sense to you of how to really apply it to your strategy on YouTube. And believe it or not, it has everything to do with the viewer. Uh, at the end of the day, it, the, understanding the viewer on a deep level will transform your content in ways that you haven't even imagined. And you got to be able to know how to research and do that research in a way with a lens that can lead to more YouTube success. And that's what it's all about here on this specific interview with Judo Sloth. Now, uh, those that don't know Judo, I want to just welcome him on. Hey, Judo. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Daryl. You're, you're too kind. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so excited because um, I've I've actually mentored a lot of different people along the way. And, you know, when I kind of imagine creating this ecosystem of helping creators, uh, you went through this journey um, and, and you pretty much hit every little level that's there in ways. And it, and it humbles me to see that what you're doing on YouTube. Um, and I just had a small little part of it. So like really excited to have you on. Why don't you like introduce yourself and, and, and share with uh, people what you actually do here on YouTube and also for work. Sure. Well, thank you so much. My name is Andrew. I, you know, run the channel Judo Sloth Gaming. I'm a Clash of Clans based creator. I like to bring content to help people, but also give them a good time where they can ent be entertained with the content and just bring joy to their lives. So that's kind of... My, the focus of my content, I've been doing this for eight years, gone through a number of different, you know, journeys, if you will, with that. And I'm excited to have a discussion with Daryl today. And I'm, I know that everybody watching is going to gain something from this, no matter where you are on your journey. So I'm excited. So my first question is, is like, how did you get started on YouTube? Because I, I know that you have advanced degrees. <laughs> like, how did you get started in all this, especially with Clash? Yeah, I mean, when I was going through my master's degree uh, for physical therapy, I that's when I used to play Clash myself. I would use it as downtime in the library, and I would used to, you know, I would watch many of the YouTubers. So I always thought it was it was interesting. It was something I you know, thought maybe one day I would do, and I'd made little videos for my clan mates as well to help them along. And when I did graduate, Clash of Clans bought a big update to the game, and I decided I was going to push as high as I could at that time. And I thought it would be really fun to just document the journey. And essentially that's how I got started from helping my clan mates and documenting my journey up to, you know, I was aiming the top of the game. Yeah, I love that. And then when did it get serious for you in the sense of like, hey, I know I'm doing physical therapy and, and I'm going this route, but maybe I should consider doing this more full time. Like when, when did that occur? I was a number of years later. I mean, my first year in YouTube, I didn't even cross the $100 threshold, actually. <laughs> um, and I'd made hundreds of videos. So it was a number of years how it kind of kept getting bigger and bigger. And it always amazed me that the amount would get larger the next, you know, the next year. Um, but it wasn't until I, I think about four or five years into my journey that I started getting to the stage where... I, I could see I could make it work. It right. was still quite a leap, um, but that's where I could, you know, foresee it happening. So let, let's talk about this, you know, three to four or five years, you know, on YouTube where, you know, you, you, it took you a year to get a hundred dollar threshold. Um, but like, how did you stay motivated? Because I think there's a lot of people here right now that maybe be they're in that journey right now, you know, have been just making minimal amount of money. And, and yet, what did you do to stay motivated and why did you continue to upload? I think I was a little bit fortunate in the sense that I didn't even realize you could make money per se. So I was literally just doing it for the enjoyment. And then when my guides were helping people, not just my friends, but helping other people, 
that was really motivating in itself. So it was more the fact of being able to help the community and just enjoying the process yeah. that kept do, me going. Do you, do you feel like it kind of was an outlet uh, for you too? It's like, hey, stressful days, this is a great way to, you know, kind of connect with the community outside of what you do day to day? Yeah, in a way, I think it was just a, another hobby that I kind of picked up. I At that time, I, was, I used to be quite competitive in judo, and I kind of took a number of injuries. That's when I took university more seriously. So I kind of needed to fill that void, if you will, of <laughs> I wasn't training in judo as hard as I used to. So I needed another hobby. And um, yeah, I kind of just... The, and that's the name that was sense. born, right? Judo? It, exactly. <laughs> sloth is just your slow with your judo techniques. <laughs> well, there's a, there's, there's a whole story behind that as well, but I'll not maybe get into, we'll, we'll not explain all of that. I did explain it on my channel at one point. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love it. So <laughs> let's kind of dive right in. So I, I want to I wanna talk about the moment that you started to see some traction on YouTube and you're like, oh, this is interesting. Um, I, need to, I need to look at it differently from maybe less from from a hobby or helping your your clan mates but more okay now let's kind of focus in on the content um you know kind of give me the dynamic around that i think for me uh, it, kind of the journey is probably the same for a lot of creators it was search content the guides that i was making to help people they were the ones that were initially gaining a bit of traction and they would also continue going um and, and bringing in views over time until you know, whether it was a certain strategy became irrelevant, then I would have to update the video as such. But it, I guess it was getting success in search first that brought me, you know, into that realm that I can push this right. further and, and, you know, it could be more than a hobby. Yeah. So let, let's kind of talk about that because I think a lot of people, when they create content, um, I think they fall within specific areas, right? So like one is more of a resource driven channel uh, where people would, would actively be searching how to do things or how, you know, the strategy side of it. Um, and, and that, you know, that kind of pigeonholes themselves into a resource channel where they don't really care for the creator. They just care for, you know, the knowledge that that creator is, is bestowing upon them. Um, did you like, and there's, there's views in that. I'm not saying that there's not, but did you, uh, uh, get discouraged? Like when some would pop off, like the videos would, would take off and others wouldn't get any traction whatsoever. Totally. I, I knew the videos I could make that would get views and I tried to make anything else and, you know, people just didn't care. So it was very frustrating at the time. You know, looking back now, I can have a very objective look at things and know that, you know, those other videos didn't bring any value to anybody really. <laughs> so that's why they didn't huh. work. You know, the search value at least was there in terms of education, but the, the videos where I was just doing whatever I wanted, uh, of course, they're not going to get any views. It wasn't actually doing anything for anybody. Um, but at that time, it was definitely frustrating. So I, yeah. you know, I've been through that and I understand where people are. But I do think it's important to go through that process because when you do analyze and, and think about why it's not working, that's where you can grow. Yeah, my, my biggest pet peeve, I would say, working with content creators on YouTube is hearing the words that um, YouTube hates me or, you know, YouTube's throttling me or YouTube's this. And I'm like, no, like that, that's, like, let's, let's, let's literally analyze your video because there's something not connecting. And they think it's the most amazing video in the world, but there's certain elements that just pull people out of the video. And I'm like, can't you see this? Like, you know, that, that's kind of frustrating me is like, you know, YouTube's out to get these creators when that's not necessarily the case. You know, I think what, what they need to do is really analyze why is this video not performing the way that it's performing? Um, and I think a lot of people get sucked into um, uh, that type of negativity that they can't be objective on their videos. Um, and so when you when you started to analyze your videos and you you started to make the decision, hey, I need to I need to go bigger. I need to uh, really you know uh, look at this opportunity because it is bringing in money. There is a there is an opportunity to actually start elevating this um, where it can go from more from a hobby maybe as a really interesting source of income to help supplement what what you're bringing in. What did you start to do? Because I think this right here is um, something that I think all the uh, people here on the live stream 
can really benefit from because, you know, a lot of people will just uh, upload videos and like, hey, you know, one day it will take off. But you actually took specific action uh, to really understand YouTube more. Indeed. Yeah. I think before I answer the question, I think it is important to say when you're analyzing content, don't expect it to be analyzed and fixed in one. You know, I was analyzing my videos the, the whole time and it, it took years of gradual learning in order to, to get there. So you're not going to be able to look at one video, analyze it and then fix everything. It's, it's something where you're just fixing small elements each time yeah. and improving your knowledge so that you, yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> small tweaks make the big peaks, right? right so man. you right. can, you can, a lot of things are maybe too advanced for you to understand before you can get to that level. Um, so I think that's important to mention before I go into this question, because I'd already built a, a, a good foundation of knowledge before I kind of made the, the switch, if you will. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was definitely the 30 day creator challenge is, is what I did and it's free, right? Like <laughs> anyone can do it. So you launched that for me at the perfect time. I was, you know, in that realm of going to go full time. But it was really which direction I, I go in. I was making a lot of daily content, which that's a whole discussion we can have, which I think is right. important. But for me, it was do I continue with daily content where the hours are limited, especially when I was still working full time. There's only so many hours you can work on a content piece. How good can that truly be? Just again, being objective with yourself. How good can you make that video in literally a couple of hours versus... When I undertook the 30 day creator challenge, my first video, I put 25 hours into. I, I literally spent the, yeah. the entire like weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday on this video. And for me, it was, that was massive. That was 10 X ever what I typically spent on those daily videos, you know, but it, it really proved proof of concept to me that it worked out of the gates. Yep. It blew up, well, let, and then let, it continued let, to blow. Yeah, up. let's show the results here because I I think that most people um, let me let me go right here. So this is the video that you actually did um, for the thirty day creator challenge, and yeah. if you if you notice, there's a line for gray that down at the bottom here. Like you literally, <laughs> like was way higher than anything you ever hit. Like 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 literally right out of the gate, it started to perform on levels. Um, where where uh, you never had before, and why why did this work this way? And I think I think you made one specific statement that's interesting. You put more time, energy, and effort into a piece of content, right? And and you know what what was the reasoning behind um, what was the reasoning behind this in this regard? Like what you put more energy and time, but were you more intentional with the, with the content? Indeed. I, I know we're going to get into the, you know, the viewer avatar and everything about that, but that, that was ultimately it. It was identifying a video that I had proof of concept. So there, there was a video where I explained anybody that saw that it was uh, four different uh, units in the yep. game. I had done a video previously where it was two units and it was still actually bringing in traffic. Yep. So it, there was justification to update that video because now there was four. So people were going to need that. But it was really thinking about what the viewers want from that. So I did mm. a lot of research in my comments section, things that I missed in that first video, researched a lot of other people's videos, or looked over Reddit, like basically anything I could find about the video I was going to make. What, a, what were people's pain points? Things well, that well, I thought could, were common sense that I overlooked. Right. You know? could, we, could we talk about that? Like, like out of the 25 hours or whatever it was for, you know, producing, how, how much time were you researching? You know, reading through the comments, going on Reddit, really trying to understand, you know, uh, the value brought and some of the things that you missed? I would say it was definitely over 50%. Um, because at that time, that was, that was eye-opening to me. You, you, you broke that down in the 30-day creator challenge. Anyone that goes and watches it will see that. Um, but really just having a specific plan. And I had you know, my notepad filled with what I was going to say in order to, to bring that value. So I can't remember specifically, but I, it was definitely more than 50%. Yeah. In fact, it was you know, more than likely greater than that. But without overestimating, it was a huge amount of time. Yeah, no, I, and, I, and I love that because I think that a lot of content creators uh, upload videos to YouTube 
and they look at validation through their comments like oh you did a great job on this upload or whatever um what what i try to to see is is there is there like a thread um, of comments, like, is there content within my content? Like, is there someone that, that said, Hey, Oh, it would have been really cool if you did this. And you had, you know, a thousand people give it a thumbs up and people said, yeah, it would have been really cool if you did this at this minute marker or whatever, you know, giving you ideas. Um, when, when you went through and started looking at those comments, what type of comments besides, Oh, he should have did this, that, that you were, um, you were using for content. Was it, was it, uh, like what, what, I guess the question would be is outside of just things that you missed, what are some of the other things that you found valuable in comments? Um, I think just going through and seeing people sharing how they used to use things. Like you said, an obvious example is, is people shared how to get them, which I had missed in the first instance, but there, there's not just one way either. So there was a thread, which was actually the top comment. So it was easy for me to find of other people sharing, you know, how to get them and then also how to use them. Why, why do you want to pick this one over this one sort of thing? Um, and obviously you have to take all of that and figure out what is important and how much depth to go into something, because it's very tricky if you're, you know, trying to make a video for the masses, how much depth do you go into something without boring certain viewers, but providing enough context to get the people that don't know about something up to speed. So it was, it was taking all of that and making sure that I was building a content piece that was appropriate for everybody. Yeah, no, I love that. Your question. No, that's great. And, and uh, for those that are curious, like we have the 30 day creator challenge, like it's in the description, but basically it's something I teach in the book. And I, I mention, um, you know, a lot is look at what's happening real time on your channel. If there's something that's consistently bringing me views, um, this gives you an opportunity to look at, is it time to update that video or is it, to up, uh, you know, is it time to maybe add on to the video where it, you can uh, pray, pay, uh, create a piece of content that would be relevant to what's bringing the traffic right now? Because I can tell you right now, one of the things that YouTube looks at uh, more than anything else is not your subscriber count. They really don't. They really don't care about that. They really haven't cared about that in a very long time. What they care about is who's actively watching your YouTube videos. Okay, collectively, what what are they doing? And when I say actively, we're saying over you know a period of twenty eight uh, days, you know ninety days, you know there, it's in it's in that in that realm of hey, if they're more active during that time, there's going to actually have more possibility for them to see your videos um, on the YouTube homepage or um, you know a strategic place in suggestion because you actually have a lot of your videos in your watch history. So YouTube's very sensitive to that. Now, when you actually started uh, this journey, you mentioned that your number one traffic source uh, was was uh, YouTube search. Now for me, um, I wanna pull this in because I think it's interesting. Um, you had 52.5% of your traffic coming from search and you're probably pretty elated you know um hey this is this is great um tell me how you feel about search i'm, I'm i don't want to poo poo on search i think search has its place but like tell me what was your strategy to get away from being a resource channel because like in search People are thinking, oh, I need to learn how to do this. They're not thinking of, oh, Judo Sloth, you know, you know, is going to help me with, with Clash. They're just going to try to figure out how to level up a specific, you know, um, you know, base or whatever. And, and they're looking for those resources from you. Uh, so, like, why, why looking at um, search differently and these traffic source differently based on what you've been able to glean from your knowledge about YouTube? Yeah, so I would say I, I don't mind search. I, I still have some videos that will pop off in search. And I think if you make a very good video um, for the homepage, it, it will still get search traffic. So that's the first thing to mention. Um, but I think for me, it was really just thinking about, and this is what, what everyone can do, just really try and put yourself in the mind of what are people doing when they're searching for a video and you, you can use mm -hmm. yourself as a as a case study right like what are the types of videos people are searching for and what is a video that would make people stop and click on the home page 
And that's where, you know, what I what I did when I was moving from search to, you know, browse and suggested was a very gradual process. There are certain videos that I had ideas of, oh, this would be really cool to make that I, I don't think I could have made at that time being a resource being a resource channel. So I had to kind of transition my audience slightly first before that video would do extremely well. So let me give you an example. Um, the Siege Machine video that I did was a, a browse uh, traffic source because it was going over every Siege Machine. I took that, used the bucket system, and I thought, what else can I go over everything? So I gave tips for every single troop in the game, every single town hall in the game, all of these different things that, yes, they still appeal to viewers who are trying to learn about the game, but if you see a video on your homepage that is, it has everything you need to know about the game, <laughs> then you're clicking it, but you're not searching for that per se. So I think it was, that was the big mind shift for me at that time. And then I could still make browse videos that appeal to browse, but that were educational. Yeah. So one of the things that I focus way in depth on in uh, the YouTube formula, um, and also, of course, you've been through my channel, Jumpstart, is I really focus in on the viewer, like really understanding viewer intention. Why are they coming to watch your video? Where are they watching the video from? Because uh, that can give us context of the value proposition. So like if someone's trying to, to uh, figure out some specific tactic and is using from search, different type of viewer than someone seeing, you know, something on browse where they're able to click on it. And then two, uh, I always like to look at where they're actually, um, uh, what the device type that they're on. Cause like if they're on television, it's completely different than mobile or different, uh, different than computer. And so really having an understanding and making um, some good educated guesses on, hey, what what are they trying to do here? What's the value proposition in this specific case? And then two, what can I do not only in this video, but, but lead them down the path where they're actually creating um, other content? And for me, um, I, I've been pretty vocal on really getting the algorithm to pick up your your content like I, I really want that and I, I do agree with you it's not that I'm anti-search at all it's just a specific way for people to come into the ecosystem and really see oh there's so much more I can't wait I you know Brent I found so much value and they want to go deeper you know it's just that 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 traffic source that really connects um, and I think a lot of content creators um, really focus in on no I want this or that and like for me I, I could care less I could as long as I get the eyeball, um, you know, and, and if that eyeball finds value and, and I think the biggest thing would be getting them to go deeper, you know, going deeper on that. And so I want to pull up your, um, just some data here. Um, so you, here you had search and you had external and then browse feature browse was like 12%. So if, if you're going to really excel on YouTube it's when YouTube starts recommending your videos, you know, when you really break it down, you had 12% and then 5% right here. Um, and, and once you started to shift and it wasn't just this immediate, Oh, this is all I'm going to do. You, you strategically started to build this, you know, it went, way different that's why it's so important here is you have now 40 percent coming from the youtube homepage, coming from uh this traffic source and 17 percent coming from uh suggested videos and you still have 25 percent that is coming through youtube search now what i love about this more than anything else is when people are coming in and discovering your channel, they're seeing it's much bigger than a video. Do you wanna kind of talk about some strategies and tactics that you've done where people come in and find you when they, they start uh, wanting to get uh, videos about Clash Clans and they start watching your videos? Can you kind of talk about that for a little bit? Of course, yeah. One thing that I, I thought you were going to mention leading into this is the search is actually, if you if you clicked into that category, Majority of that is people searching judo sloth. So yeah. I'm okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that is where you build a community and you will have viewers that don't watch every single video. That's that's okay. It's 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 silly to think that people will watch every single one of your videos. You, because you don't watch every video of, of your favorite creators. <laughs> you you kind of pick and pick and choose what appeals to you. Some some creators you might. 
So I think as you build out your library and as you build out um, trustworthiness within your community, they will come to you for certain things. And that's where, you know, I have that search traffic coming in. And that's where people now have my channel in their minds as, oh, I'm going to go to judo, you know, right. for, for certain topics. And then you can use that to pull people in deeper. Maybe you've released a couple of videos you know, in that time where they come back and view you for a certain thing. And then YouTube is more likely to recommend them the videos that you have made before that, based on what Daryl was just saying, the watch history. They might then go down the rabbit hole again of, oh, I didn't see this video recommended to me. I didn't see this one, you know, and it might just take that of them coming back to your channel in order to to be recommended future videos. And I think that's where over time you can build that with your community and you know, you want to just be trying to always think about YouTube is all about community at the end of the day. It's not about single viral videos. You want right. to build true retention is building that trust with your community. And a, a lot about you, I'm sure there's some, something we can get into, but you know, storytelling is huge. Who's actually delivering the story. That's me. Yep. So yep. they need to be connected with me in order to come back to the videos and that reflects in retention as well. Yeah, and I, I do want to segue into storytelling because I think this is one of the most important aspects, um, you know, of of content creation. Is like people come for value, and um, but humans we connect with story, and and story is a way to learn more. Uh, retain more, um, have more entertainment, find something a lot more interesting and fun and engaging. And it's, it, it, we're just kind of programmed for storytelling. Um, when, when you went from uh, very specific how-to tutorials, uh, tactics and strategies, and, and how did you start learning about storytelling? Because I think that right there, like if you look at your old content, which I did, you know, before we got on, I'm like, man, that was pretty sterile, man. It was just like, here's what you yeah. need. This is what you got. <laughs> you, you didn't waste a word or anything. It was just like, okay, this is exactly what it is, right? But like, what did you, what did you do for storytelling? How did you start um, using that to make uh, better videos? Yeah, so I, I, again, it's kind of a gradual thing as, as I was transitioning my channel. I actually went back and some of my search videos that were doing very well, I would remake them knowing they were for search, but I would remake them with a slightly different tone because I felt like I was becoming better on camera. I was able to build trustworthiness with the community. And I also you know, understood elements of videos better. So I would replace the videos that I knew were doing well with search with better videos that helped people to connect with me more. But also at the end of those videos, I would be signposting and hinting them into other videos that would bring them deeper into the rabbit hole. And as I was making that transition, I was then able to bring videos that were both educational and entertaining, and then gradually move across to entertainment style videos still bring that education i think it's it's important to stick to your core values and that's why that's right. i set up my channel in the first place uh, but i was able to pivot to more videos that were pure entertainment and that is where you know you can open up the, the doors of, of huge views so it was more of a transitional process and that was kind of one tactic i used to bring yeah. my audience with me on that journey I, I think the big thing for me is I think it's really easy. I know this might sound arrogant, but I think it's really easy to get a view on a video. Um, but it's very difficult to get multiple views on multiple videos. It's like getting that one person to want to go deeper with you, I think, is a very hard um, mm -hmm. craft. Um, and it's something that I think is, is completely doable. Uh, but I think it's just more, where do you focus? Is it more the long game? Like how, you know, how are you processing the viewers, uh, you know, journey in your, your content? And if you really look at some of the most amazing channels out there, they're the best storytellers. You know, you want to go back because you find so much value that you're like, ah, I can't wait. And it doesn't matter what the content is. You just know you're going to be entertained or there's going to be that value that's uh, transferred from there. And I think, you know, if you look back at your your content and just be more intentional. How can I make it better? And then how can I tell a better story where people simply understand knowing what's going on 
and have a more vested interest in, in, in the video itself. And then also get so excited that they want to go deeper, whether it's hitting that subscribe button or when they see that next thumbnail pop up, there's that similarity there that they'll actually click on it and watch it even deeper. So what, what, uh, what advice would you give content creators right now in the storytelling uh, process? Like what, what have you learned along the way? And, and then how have you used it? How have you used data uh, to help understand what works and what doesn't work? Okay. How long have we got? <laughs> we, we got time, brother. <laughs> um, I think what you said was very important in that you know, everyone talks about getting the click, which is massive. That is the first thing you need to do is draw people into your video. The hard bit is making a good video and connecting with the viewer. I would say if you're just starting out with storytelling, there's lots of different um, theories that you can follow, whether it's the three act structure, the story circle, uh, hero's journey, five P's, three C's, like go and, go and research all of these different theories read them and apply your video to them. And you, you know, you can, a lot of them you can print out and actually jot it down. Going through that process again and again helps you to become very um, deliberate with your content, but also you don't then need to rely on those theories. They just kind of become second nature to you once you've gone through them. So I think it's important to first just go away, research them, but actually apply it. That's one mistake that I think a lot of people do is they do all this reading, but they don't actually apply it. Um, so I think that would be the first thing. And then obviously- Or, or, this, do, you think, or do you think they apply too much? Like either they don't apply it or they try to do everything all at once? Or what, what do you think on that? Um, yeah, potentially both. Um, I would say there's kind of different elements. One is people read everything and then they, they think they're applying things, but maybe they're, yeah. maybe they're not. Yep. And then another element is people try to add too much content. I, I'm guilty of this. I'm not saying it's, you know, this is what I used to do. I, I watched some of my old videos and I'm like, we're two minutes in. I haven't started the video yet because I'm cramming all of this context at the start of the video. And like people, people just want to get into it. So I think you can over research and then think I need to include all of this stuff and you put it at the start, but actually you need to learn where context is appropriate and where progressing through the story is appropriate. I, and I that's gotta, something that comes with time. I got to tell you this, because like we, we were taking kind of more of a, a relaxed week, um, you know, with my family, have everybody, you know, in, in uh, the house here. And we were watching YouTube and they literally stopped me and says, Dad, we hate watching YouTube with you. I'm like, why, <laughs> why, why do you hate watching YouTube with me? Because you, you literally skip. You're like, that's boring. Like, I literally <laughs> skip videos. Like, have you, and they're like, have you ever finished a video? I'm like, I have. Like, you know, like <laughs> I have. I find it, but like, that was boring. I was like, I know, but you know, we don't need your your play by play commentary. And then I have one son says, yes, we do. Like, <laughs> but um, I, I think. I think, you know, really looking at what you said, it's just like when you're looking back and and are you applying storytelling? And then two, you, you mentioned something that I think that most people um, don't really do, which is they put up content, but you went back and watched all their content. You're like, wait a minute, it's like two minutes in and I, I didn't even start the video yet. Well, how many people have dropped off because you didn't start the video yet? You know, and and now you're you're more hyper sensitive, hyper aware of oh, if they clicked on it, I only got a few few seconds to pull them in to the actual video, and if I lose it, you know, if I lose like seventy percent of the people in the first thirty seconds, which a lot of people do, you know, just because they're you know the value is not there, you know, mm. what what is that going to impact the 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 um, the, I guess the, the, uh, ability for that, that video to really take off. Yeah, for sure. You have to, you have to know why people are clicking on the video. Like what is your value proposition when people are going in, what are they expecting? And you need to deliver on that instantly. This is all stuff that you'll have heard time and time again. Right. But you really need to try and think about it. Put yourself in the shoes of the viewer. Why are they clicking on the video? 
what do you need to deliver them to? Yes, you need to provide them context. I don't want people to take out of context what I said. Like you need to actually bring people into the video, but people try to give too much context. So you need to give context, deliver, build curiosity and get into the video. And then you can dr drip feed elements of further context as you're going through the video. Uh, delving deeper with your viewer and that's where understanding your avatar is important it it yes it can help with the ideas and the video you bring but it can help with peppering in the content to build out your story and actually go deeper with the viewer because if if you're just you know flatlining progressing all the time you're you're never actually giving those ups and downs then it kind of makes a bit of a boring video if you just have you know all progression you don't actually have exciting parts and bits where you slow the pace down to connect with your viewer and then people people just tune out because you are not giving them the variety that they need um so did, did you did you find that when you started to give them variety you actually had videos that would go out to a broader market than just the person that was getting you know that tactical information for sure yeah you can you can have to, i mean and you can Think about it yourself as well, the types of videos you are drawn to, because w when you're just giving information, you're only hitting a small market in the sense that most people play games for fun. Yes, you know, winning at the game is going to provide enjoyment, but people only ever need advice at one specific moment in their journey. Whereas if you are delivering you know, pieces that have stories built into them and those exciting moments, they will enjoy that time and time again. So yeah. that's where that mind shift can help to open up the views for sure. Yeah, and I think I think the biggest thing is knowing your avatar. And so what what are some of the ways besides reading comments that you get to know who's watching your video and what they actually care about? What's their psychographics? Like like I think demographics like we can we can pull in from analytics, but how do you understand mm. the psychology of the viewer? So you can do it in a number of different ways. Essentially, you are always making assumptions and you're trying to validate those assumptions from the data. So you would be, yes, looking at the comments, looking at the content that they respond to and do not respond to. How are, how are they engaging with it? Not even just with comments. Are they liking it? Are they sharing it? YouTube so shows when people share it. If you ever actually talk to somebody that's discussed your videos, one of the, like, watch your videos, one of the things I always ask them is like, you know, What's a video that's that you've enjoyed the most or what what element of a video? Right. So you can have conversations with people. I'm sure if there's other gamers here, a lot of people will have their own Discord, just being able to see what people are chatting about and, and that side of things. Some people use the community tab. Um, but you also you also have to think about what the viewer wants before they even know that they want it. So to give an example to try and, and go into that, my content, yes, is for um, educating people in Clash of Clans, but I am only really going to hit uh, the the kind of the average players, if you will. Once you get to a pro level, they don't they don't need my content. They don't they understand things to a deeper level. If you've ever heard of the novice expert continuum. Uh, which can be applied to YouTube as well. When you're a novice, you have like zero confidence. When you are, you know, getting good at something, your confidence is at its peak. And then as you become an expert, it drops down because you understand the depths of everything. So that can be applied as a as a creator. But in terms of my viewers, they are kind of at that peak. They are good players. They're watching YouTube content, so they're above average if they are able to replicate a strategy I show them, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they're the, the best player in the world. So they have That's a right. certain amount of swagger and confidence about them. And just, you know, that's something they would never tell you, but it's something that you, when you're analyzing your call confident uh, content and delving into who your viewer is, you need to really be trying to think about that stuff as well. So that's just kind of one example of, of how I was thinking of my content, knowing that these are my viewers, what are some of the traits they will have? 
And it's yeah. just just analyzing and thinking about what that is. Right. And I think it's suggesting too, because it's like once you analyze it, you're like, okay, how do I approach this topic with this uh, viewer in mind? Right. So mm-hmm. that's where your content is elevated. It speaks deeper to, you know, the the viewer itself, those that feel that way. Um, and there's that underlining theme as well. Um, so I really want to know kind of your process. Like what what do you do to prepare for a video? Like what's your process of coming up with the idea, understanding how to weave a story into it. Could you kind of go through kind of your process on selecting an idea and then understanding the value and where you put emphasis on the video before you even pick up the camera? I will try and um, articulate this as as best as possible because I think, uh, again, what we've been discussing is that things happen Mm -hmm. over time from being deliberate and researching and, and you kind of you just get a bit of a sixth sense on things as well. So I have a huge list of ideas that I'm always kind of adding to as well. There's different ways you can come up with ideas, whether that is researching in your own niche, researching outside of your own niche, what is happening on YouTube? Could that be applied to your game? Within gaming, it's it's huge, right? You can look at right. the most popular games out there, see what they're doing. Could that be applied to my game? Um, or there is trying to come up with original ideas, which I will say is the best. If you can come up with an original idea that pops, you have the biggest potential because it's not being done before. It's new to people. That's where you can really hit home. And you would do that from going through your game and again, understanding your avatar of what their pain points are, but obviously what is kind of entertaining and obscure to them as well. Once you've kind of come up with an idea what can you make content out of that from? Is there actually enough meat on that idea that it could be a long form video? Could it be a short? You have to go through the process of, if someone is clicking this video, what could they be, um, you know, what could they be expecting and what content could be delivered in that? The storyline, as you're saying. I mean, even before that, I skipped over, can you actually come up with a, a good title and thumbnail for this video? But then it's trying to think about, if you get a storyline in mind, yeah, let's make this a long form video then. Um, what is that? Go through the, the story structures, as I said, and, and the frameworks. See if you can plan out the different elements. Once you've done that and you think, okay, this is a video that is a, a terrific idea. People are going to click it. I know I can kind of build a good narrative with this where retention would be uh, built into it, if you will. How do you make it? How do you go deeper? How do you connect with the viewer? on a deeper level at that stage. So, you know, whether that is understanding your avatar, are there any moments that you might hit a frustrating point that you know other people have hit as well and you can relate to them with that? You can be empathetic with them. And how are you going to, you know, activate your community through the storyline as well? Um, So, yeah, that was, that's kind of the... I, I don't know if people like if you found value in what you just said, just put it in the comments because like that alone, like if, if if content creators would just rewind and listen to what you just said, going through the process of preparing to create a video and just thinking of all kind of the, the psychological triggers and the things that would actually be engaging, they would make so much better content. Cause like at the, at, at the whole root of the problem is you, you, uh, most content creators that I've worked with in the beginning, they, they have maybe four or five ideas, but they're not thinking of bigger ideas or anything like that. Like the first thing that you're doing is like, you have this big list of ideas and you're selecting which one's going to be the most impactful right now, um, you know, based on the trending, based on your own uh, data in the sense of what's in real time and say, okay, this would be great. And then when you, when you do it, you're already selecting a title. You already have a thumbnail. You're saying, okay, what, what are we doing for the hook? Very specific. How are we pulling them in? And then more importantly, what are the triggers that will emotionally have them connect? to the content you know what is the triggers there and you're kind of identifying hey in doing this specific video they're going to be more inclined to be frustrated here well if you call out the frustration that's that bonding moment that you need Mm. to connect you know or you know most of you get frustrated because of this and you're not thinking of that oh my gosh that's me 
you brought value in in a way that they haven't done before and so for me to do that beforehand uh, a lot of people will just kind of uh, free flow it and i'm like what the heck are you doing man like 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 this like this is so important you're you're putting a lot of time energy and effort into a video when you pull up the camera but and in and, and the edit but where the bulk of the time should be is in in pre-production you know basically the bulk of the time sure. how can we actually execute on it now i do want you to be spontaneous i do want people to um to be free flowing but they at least did the work beforehand to know some of these things that will come in very handy as they're putting out the content uh, i just think it's just more authentically uh a deeper way to connect with your audience. And then ultimately, when that audience connects with you, then it means something more. Um, now, one thing that I know that you do, I, I, I would say at an expert level, I, I would say this, is you're really, really, really good at the viewer's journey. Um, and I would say, you know, really looking at channels, uh, people, uh, if you want to really define the viewer's journey, there's new people discovering your channel every day and they're at a certain level and there's certain people that come and play the game at a certain level. Uh, could you just talk about just the different types of viewers that you have in their journey? And when you focus in on just one of them and exclude the rest, how that can impact your channel? Yeah, so I think you should always try and break down your avatar, and you will have more than one avatar as well. That's kind of what we were discussing before of how not everyone will watch every single video. And that's that's also, I don't know if we'll discuss this later, how you have to look at the data in a very specific way because it's all mashed into one a lot of the time, particularly retention. Um, but in terms of a viewer, it, it really just thinking about how they are finding your channel whether you know you might be in a position where they are finding you through search because you not everyone's at the same level you have to think about your your goals as a channel as well like what is your value proposition for a video and across your channel and how can you best display that to the the viewer in terms of you know people think about their banner art and their their playlists and their homepage and that is all important but the content that you are important. bringing, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's one so of those things. Sorry, but but the content that you're bringing, right. you should be deliberate in the content you're bringing, the bucket system, and just making sure that you are delivering that value again and again and again. But that's where the buckets are helpful as well, is you can bring people through their journey. Maybe you have a bucket that is designed at beginners, right? And you would de you would design that content very specifically to bring them and elevate that that viewer to a next piece of content and how are you going to flow them through the videos that's one thing that i didn't mention in terms of the process is what what are you going to send them to next and how are you going to pepper that into the content to actually signpost them to that next and that could be from search to another uh, a video a sense um so yeah, I think it's just trying to think about the content that you're bringing and not every video has to appeal to every single viewer. It, it just depends on the journey that the stage in the journey that you are on and how you can help to um, elevate a viewer through different buckets of your content to then, is there something there for, for those yeah, you know those beginners, if you will. But it again, it depends on what you're you're going for. Like you might be a pro player, and your target aud audience might just be pro players. So your viewer journey would be completely different than mine, where I am just going for everybody that is playing Clash of Clans and interested in Clash of Clans, has played Clash of Clans. Like I'm trying to pull in everybody. So that's that's totally different than identifying your audience and thinking about the videos and the you know the buckets that they would want to see. Yeah, and I think that's where it comes back down to understanding your audience in the level that you can speak to multiple audiences at once, right? So we know what our core audience is, and I think that's what it is. Hey, people that play the game, we love it, right? But they're at different levels of the game. And I just, I found that when you bring value consistently and people are entertained, they're going to still watch regardless of what it is, regardless if it's more for noobs um, than, than it is for pros. You know, I think at the end of the day, it's like, like people will, will watch it and try 
to say, okay, I've found that entertaining, or you did it in a way that it's just more about the community than it is about the tactic. Mm. And so I, 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 I saw a couple comments, uh, you know, in preparatory for this, because I always look for it, is like, you know, people like watch you watch every video, you know, they'll, they'll watch regardless of what it is, because they love the way that you're, you're, you know, analyzing and you're bringing your humor, you're bringing in the community and they just enjoy it. They enjoy the community. And even though the community isn't like trending like other games out there, they feel like they belong to, you know, the, they belong um, and, mm. and they want kind of, that connection, you know, that deeper connection than just playing the game very specifically. And so, you know, when I when I saw those comments, it's like, hey, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not interested in this, but I'm gonna watch it anyway. Those are the types of comments I love yeah. that says, hey, you're speaking to them at a deeper level. Um, but I do believe that, you know, understanding your audience is so key and, and then really anticipating them. That's what you said, that YouTube six sense where you're anticipating, oh, they would love this uh, because all it is is an assumption, right? You're, you're making mm -hmm. a very uh, big assumption and then you can validate it whether they respond well or not. Um, and, and I know that a, a lot of content creators get really frustrated and they, they, they do it because they think that it's a great idea and they get excited about the idea, but they're not really seeing how it would be received. Like it might be too complicated. It might be too complex, you know, yeah. and you, you know how I talk about simplicity. It's like, you gotta be simple, simple to understand, simple to share. And I think the biggest value, and this is something that I can't wait for everyone to really understand is, you know, that it's great to have a click. It's great to have a good storytelling. Um, you know, involved in the video. But my question to you is what is the shareable moment? Like what is the shareable moment? What is it when people go, oh my goodness, and they leave in the comment a time code or they, they actually edit out the video and share it out there, mm. or they're sending very specifically that video and they're thinking of four or five different people that should see it. Because if the video doesn't have a shareable moment, I don't think you prepared uh, uh, well enough. No. You know, because if, yeah. if you really need to focus in on that, for sure. And I think if anybody, um, you know, wants to go away from here, you can research uh, like peak end theory, which demonstrates that perfectly. One, the share is how the content is going to be, um, you know, spread like wildfire. You always want to make sure, and you think about that with everything your titling, how, how are people going to discuss this with their friends? Is it easy for them to do that? Um, but essentially, peak end theory is is a little bit like you can't recall everything from a video. You remember the highest point, what was the most epic moment in the video. You remember that. That's the moment you would share. And you remember the end because you're more likely to remember what happened at the end of the video than you are at the start of the video. So if you make sure there is a, a shareable moment, like Daryl said, in the video, that's the peak and end on a high. That's the bit people are going to remember so they're far more likely to watch another video of yours afterwards yep. once you've put those principles in place and, and that is the goal that's the the viewer journey uh for sure well let's um let's kind of uh well i want to be able to take questions and so we're going to still do that but sure. we, i really want to go through the buckets because if i ever had a student that really understood how to use buckets but also how to experiment along the way uh i would say that you're you're definitely at the top of the list and so uh, let me pull up um a couple of these this this is a your three easy star buckets uh, so you can see, I, I love the graph when it goes like literally straight up to the moon, <laughs> you know, it, it's so great. And you, you can see that these videos, um, are, are really, really performing well. Could you kind of talk about what is the bucket system and, and why is it important for content creators to think in, in that sense? Yeah. So the bucket system is, I mean, it, it's kind of, as it sounds, if you think about content within a bucket, that should be very related. Um, and you should make that as easy for the viewer to know that that is the video in that bucket. And that is titling, uh, you know, similar thumbnail, similar narrative, pacing, editing, whatever you can think about to give the viewer that 
repeated experience. There's a reason that people watch every Marvel movie, right? Because <laughs> they know the value that they're going to get beforehand, but they're going to enjoy that experience along the way. And I think some creators, I was guilty of this as well, think, oh, I don't want to make that video because I've already made it. And, you know, but if it's delivering a set value and people are enjoying it and consuming it, why would you not make that video again? You know, if people are enjoying it, that's what you want to bring, right? So, and then it's also really... not everybody's watching your videos. Like, 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 if everyone was watching your videos, that would be a For different sure. conversation. But they haven't, you know. Yeah, the amount of times that a, a, a second video, even if it's got, you know, it, it has to have a twist. Don't get me wrong; yeah. you can't just repeat the same video. But the amount of times you have new viewers, you can see that in your analytics as well, and and from the comments of what people are saying that people will find that video as a new viewer is, is mind boggling. So you always have to keep that in mind, but, but kind of sticking to the question, it, the buckets are um, systems of content that you can make, which makes it easy for the viewer to be followed along that journey and be recommended the content. But also once you understand the recommendation system and, and Todd went into this in great depth, mm -hmm. uh, he's done it numerous times. In fact, People will be suggested content that are that is very similar to start with. So that's within the same bucket. They will be suggested content from the same channel, but kind of a, a slightly different area because YouTube knows that viewers like variety. So they'll be suggested a different bucket in there as well. But then, you know, other channels within the same niche, even things outside of the niche. And that's where that's actually where people with multiple channels can, can kind of take advantage if you will of that real estate if you do have podcasts being a prime example it's kind of a different viewer in terms of eclipse and a, a full length view um but they could still be suggested alongside each other because youtube sees it as a different channel and a different viewer if you will but it's switching the the um you know the realm that viewers are going down because people want variety in content uh, so I know I started going off topic a little bit there at the end, but that's the bucket system and how you can visualize a viewer going through it. Um, and it's always that cliche of like replace algorithm with audience. And that's kind that's of right. exactly the that's thing, right? right? Then, like YouTube will be suggesting that content in that manner, but it's because that's how viewers respond and, and go through their journey. Yeah, my my big thing when it comes back down to it, it's like really understanding there's a systematic way to create content, right? Um, I, I look at TV as the prime example. Uh, TV, believe it or not, is pretty much the bucket system. Like, you know what your value proposition, you can pretty much mm. do a play-by-play -play breakdown, especially at the sitcoms of the way it's gonna play out and the way it's gonna do and the way it's gonna go into it. It's, it's very formulaic. Um, and then two, ultimately, when they deviate from that, there's like a disconnection. So like, um, I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. I, I love Seinfeld. Um, it, you know, some of you might not know what the, the TV show is all about. It's a show about nothing, but it was very systematic. Like every, every, um, you know, every episode was four different perspectives and how they were so different and they all interweaved into the punchlines for Jerry, uh, to get on stage and, uh, to do that. Now the, the, the finale, I didn't actually like the finale. And the reason why is they broke the model of what the show was about from my perspective. And I, I understand they wanted to weave it in this whole way and you know, the writers can do whatever they want, but ultimately I think a lot of people didn't like it because it broke what the system was, what, what they've been uh, very comfortable with for well over 10 seasons. Um, you know, and it's just like, okay, you know, people expect the videos to be a certain way, you know, and I think buckets give you the ability to wash, rinse and repeat, but bring in more creativity, how to level it up and make the, the content better. Now, that being said, I think you understand this better than most is bucket systems, basically elementary level content creation, right? So it's like, Hey, if you want to succeed, this is the way you succeed. And more of the exper experimental side is where I think it's the advanced version is content creators. You want to kind of talk about that because like, I know that we've had this conversation before. Um, and I think a lot of people just take this and then this is the only way they do it. It's like, okay, I'm going to do my buckets. Got to have, you know, my five mm -hmm. or six buckets that's there and I'm not really pushing the needle. Do you want to kind of, uh, go in a little bit more depth on that? Of course. Yeah. I think you always should be improving as a, a, a person 
improving your skill sets. And the bucket system is one thing that helps you to understand the process of content, helps you to you know, get in the mindset of the viewer, can help get you going, if you will, get you to that level. But then if you're just making that predictable content, you're never going to grow. Um, so you should still, and this is a gradual process as well of, of kind of transitioning through, but the more you understand content in the viewer, the more you will get a, a sixth sense as to whether a video is going to pop or not. Whether it's, you know, at first when you're going through video ideas, you want to try and validate that with data. Is this video going to work or is it not? But then you can validate that with your sixth sense, if you will. But that takes a lot of time and a lot of content to get to that level. And that's where, you know, the cliche of make 100 videos and, you you know, it's all building into that. And it's building into a lot of different things as well, by the way. But you then want to get to the stage of just making the video next that you know will be the best video for your viewer. Like, that's what you always yeah. want to do. Make the best video. And... One thing that I didn't mention before with like my ideas, you always want to, yes, select the best idea, but the best idea that you can execute on right now. That's right. That's so right. there were there were certain ideas that I've had and, and still have where I don't think I can execute on them 100% right now. I'm not going to ditch that idea. It's just that you need to be realistic of where you are, what you can do, your process, what is your team? Can you actually make that video and make it well where the viewer will uh, find value in it, respecting the viewer's time, right? So I think it's being selective on the best video for the viewer at that point, whether it's in a bucket system or not, but also it has to be realistic for you to actually create at yeah. that moment, whether it's related to your skill set, your resources, whatever it is. Yeah, I would 100% I would say that, hey, the idea is it needs to get you excited and then it needs to be feasible, right? Can you actually pull yeah. that off? Um, for me, I love to brainstorm. I love to come up with ideas. You know me. Like I, I, yeah. I just, I thrive in that realm and I literally have a list of ideas because I dedicate time every single day, every single day for coming up with ideas. Um, I think it's a, a muscle that needs to be developed, right? I think it's a muscle that needs to be um, exercised. And so every every day I spend 20 minutes just with ideation. And I think the ideation, once you understand, hey, it's great that you have an idea, but if it doesn't have a, a clickable title or a clickable thumbnail, <laughs> then you need to reevaluate that. And then two, mm. I also found that some ideas should never warrant its own standalone video. But it might be a segment. It might be just a, a peppers, a little bit of pepper yep. into your content. Like that alone is there. And I think, I think too, uh, not only just the ide ideation of coming up with a title and thumbnail and kind of the, 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 the flow of a video, but it's like, how do we punch up a video? And I love doing that. Like right now I'm working with a creator. Um, he was able to get 256 thousand subscribers in 28 days. I love it. And hopefully he's going to be a case study here at, at VidSum. We're trying to get to a million um, within a very short amount of time. Um, but it's like getting so granular on punching up moments. And like, I like to brainstorm on, hey, it would be really cool if you did this because it's trending or because this is a meme or this is going to engage your audience even deeper. I, I love that. I love doing stuff like that too. And I, I would hope that uh, content creators would, would spend the adequate amount of time coming up with the idea and the video and the, the flow of the video, but then taking some breathing room, getting, you know, a kind of a pattern interrupt mindset and then coming back into it and say, okay, how do we punch this up? How do we make it better? Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and taking elements, oh, it'd be really cool. This would be really funny if we did this, even before you shoot the video. And then two, when you're shooting the video, doing some extra things that might not ever see the light of day, but it gives you options to do stuff in the edit. And so for me, you know, I, I think there's so much, uh, a part of storytelling 
And then two, looking at those moments that you can actually punch up your content. I think that's fascinating. And I think that's interesting. And I think it's something that I know you do very specific, Andrew. Uh, but I think everyone should to look at it. It's like, how, how do we take it up just one notch further? Or what can we do here in this specific mm-hmm. setting? Or, oh, this would actually engage them. This would trigger them in a positive way or trigger them in a negative way. How do we actually uh, do this as a part of the, the story arc? Um, and then also, you know, what is that share? moment I think is is really powerful so um, really really excited um, what we're gonna do is I want to transition into uh, the business side uh, just because I, I think a lot of people uh, would would love and find a lot of value in this and um, and then two, stick around because I'm giving away vid summit tickets um, I'm also going to open it up to, to questions that you can ask Andrew or myself. Uh, we want to make sure that we bring enough value for you. So that's what's happening here. Um, but when when you're getting your master's degree in physical therapy and, and you had your eyes on that, um, I would assume that you're trying to like, okay, this is how I'm going to provide for my family or my future family. Um, when did it get interesting where you're like, huh, <laughs> like... I, I can go do this or I can go do this. Um, like what was kind of the, that process of, you know, taking it from a hobby, taking it from a secondary income and deciding to go all in on that? Yeah. So I essentially was continuing to, to grow, as I was mentioning. Um, when my uh, content got to making the same amount of money as my full-time job, it was certainly when... <laughs> I was thinking, okay, I can I can do this, but in my mind at that time, I wasn't, you know, at the level I am now. I was thinking, how sustainable is this? And I think right. that is what everybody goes through. How sustainable is this? So I would say I wasn't as bit of big of a risk taker at that moment. I made sure to kind of put the money aside that I was making from content so that I knew if I left my job, I wasn't then my videos weren't quite doing as well, or I didn't have to rush back into you know, grabbing a job or something. So I was quite uh, strategical at that point. Um, But I guess also the fact that my YouTube channel was making money. I was also doing uh, commentary for the esports of the game. So there was more than one avenue of monetization coming in. And it was trending up (laughs) as well, right? There was not a limit on how far I could go with it. Whereas when I worked in the hospitals... It, it's very much these are the steps that you take and this is right. how much money you're going to make. And it's not all about money either. Don't get me wrong. For me, my little boy um, was born in the summer that I went full time. And that was wait, 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 my... Wait, 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 wait. So you went full time when you're having a baby? Oh, it was... Yeah, okay, a lot of people the were, were questioning. <laughs> yeah. what, a lot of people your... were questioning. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what was your wife's thoughts on that? Because like, like that's the moment in life that you'd want more stability, man. <laughs> yeah, like, I think you know, <laughs> my parents' questioning was was certainly different. My wife's very supportive. Um, I you know, I couldn't do what I what I do with it. it wasn't for my wife, and she knew that I'm the type of person that if I put my mind on something, I'm going to give it a hundred percent and I'm going to mm. make it work. So she kind of knew that I was going to make it work. But also, that was reason for leaving. One, I was not going to have the time to keep up two full-time jobs as I was doing. Um, But two, I was then going to be able to work from home and I can adjust my hours. You you know, you can't slack off. You're not going to get anywhere if that's what you do. But I could adjust my hours and being able to spend time, you know, with my family was the main reason for going uh, full-time and also I, just enjoying what I do. Oh yeah. Yeah. And being able to No, I love yeah. I love the why. I love, you know, the the risk taking cuz like like there's a lot of people that won't do it until they reach reach a certain level, but yet at a very pivotal time you're like, "Hey, I can't do two full-time jobs and and also be a father." <laughs> you know, I want to yeah. give them the adequate time and so you, ha- you you made the decision. And then having the support of your spouse is huge too. You know, this is very uh, you know, very very interesting um, you know, kind of a path that you're that you're taking at a very critical time. When did it when did when did it um, become at a point where you're like, "Okay, 
I'm starting to excel. Um, there's no bottom to this opportunity and we're starting to create new opportunities. Like when, when did you decide, you know what, um, this is literally outside of my control. I need to bring more people, more team members on to help, you know, help, uh, help me take it to the next level. Yeah, that, that's actually what I was going to, to, to go into. So when I went uh, full time, essentially you're halving your income at that point. Um, but I knew I could then put the time I needed, given the video I had seen from the 30 day creator challenge, I could put the time that I needed to grow because that was, to me, what I felt was the main thing holding me back was time, essentially, yeah. and where to put that time. So I knew I could make it work and grow from there. And then I would say after the 30 day creator challenge, I had, you know, seen a lot of growth. Things were going up over. I invested in Channel Jumpstart, which was clearly the next natural progression for me. After Channel Jumpstart, I then kind of got to a stage where my time was, I mean, I work a lot more hours now than I did at the <laughs> hospital. I work silly hours. Um, but essentially, and, and I think this is important for creators to, to learn as well, because sometimes it's very difficult to know when to outsource, when to hire an editor, when to get help from people. And you need to be at a stage where the money you're spending to bring someone else on opens up your time to then, you know, elevate and do more. Because if you're just shifting time and resources around aimlessly, then you can you can end up getting into like difficult positions. So I would say after Channel Jumpstart, maybe about six months after that, I had consistently brought in, um, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily think it's fair to put dollar amounts on things, but I would consistently brought in more than I ever thought I could make on YouTube, put it that way. That's um, so that's when I thought right now, the only way to elevate is to bring someone else in. And I also think, by the way, it's important before you outsource that you understand the processes of things. Because if you just hire an editor, but you don't understand what makes a good video or how to actually edit a video, you're not going to be a very good uh, like boss, you're putting, if you want to call putting, it yeah, that. You're putting the hands of something that's so important to somebody that might not understand what they need to do. Or, you know, it's just like, it's double the effort. And so uh, I, I remember having a conversation with you um, after Channel Jumpstart, I have a continuity program and we, we I'm able to go a lot deeper into the business side and strategy and so on and so forth. And when you were looking to, to start bringing team members on, um, and one of the things that I talk about very religiously is work week analytics, where you yep. identify <laughs> everything that you do, um, you know, every day, every moment of the day, and you write it down, doesn't matter if it's for business or personal, and you just write it down. And at the end of the week, you take two highlighters, one to highlight everything that wasted your time, you know, and highlight that. And then also highlighted the stuff that you hated to do. <laughs> and, and you magically have something for someone to do so that you can actually um, really just do what you love to do and stuff that doesn't waste your time. Uh, when did you make the decision to bring a personal assistant on? I think that's a really important time. Um, and then two, what, what did you have them do uh, in that regard? Um, so actually it was, it was only recently um, because I was kind of micromanaging everything. And again, I think it's important to go through that process so that you understand um, the business side of things as well. If you are treating it as a business, you need to be able to understand every element. I mean, think about it this way. If, you, um, if your boss doesn't know what you do at work, how does that make you feel? You yeah. know, it's just, it, 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 there's a disconnect in trust, if you will, between you and your boss. So I think it's important to go through those processes, but just recently, um, and essentially a lot of what I'm doing now is just what, what, what you did, Daryl, in just watching what I do um, and trying to understand the systems and processes because everyone has a different process. So they need to understand exactly how I work and how my system is at the moment to see where they can help to elevate. Um, so at the moment, it's a lot of research, um, building out, uh, like watching what I do, a lot of um, 
you know, summarizing, you know, maybe like reading a certain, it, it's, you, you should be always educating yourself, reading, watching videos, podcasts, like there's, there's endless content now that you cannot absorb them all. Right. Um, but essentially like summarizing some of that stuff as well so that we can have a discussion and just having a second opinion as well on what is working and what's not working. And, and that's what you can do with creators as well. I think that's one thing we haven't touched upon is actually just masterminding with other creators right. and actually, again, being objective about your content and not getting offended yep. by someone's comments because you should be able to take that and actually elevate what you're doing. And I personally love when someone tells me they don't like something about my content <laughs> and why it is. And so, because sometimes you can't, you can't actually, you know, break out of things. I would say one piece of advice that I would give to people is do not be afraid to forget what you know to grow yep. because you can get stuck in your ways of how things used to work or that maybe you've even seen data in your videos that would suggest that something works. But if you never reanalyze and test to see if that is shifted, then you're never going to expand. And that's why if I have other creators that say like, what, what are you doing here? Yeah. And if I have to try and justify what I'm doing, then I have to think to myself, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah. What, like that, that being so critical, I think is key is just like the ability to be open to receive feedback and then to not to get defensive, but to reset your mind and say, okay, what can I learn from this? Or is this really what I thought, you know? And I think having good feedback is key. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I love when it's cultivated around a company, you know, if people giving you the right type of feedback, um, cause then, then you, you're making smarter decisions as a company. Cause like being a YouTube channel, it's much more than that. I mean, like you're an hmm. entertainment company. There's a lot of different things that you can do and there's different roles and, you know, would you ever imagined when you actually started YouTube that not only you do it full time, but start employing some of your family members and, and some team members and, and building something that you have currently today? Did you ever, did it even cross your mind that it would be this big? No, of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I'd be lying if I said that, you know, I even thought it would. And I, I had confidence in my ability to grow it, but I didn't know that I would be able to get to that stage of, you know, actually having team members employed and yeah it's it's fantastic and it's something that um i'm very blessed to be able to do that and obviously to support my family in in that sense as well so it's incredible well i love it well let's let's kind of open it up to questions so if you have a question for andrew go ahead and put it in the comments there um before we do that i i want to talk about an opportunity that's coming up it is vid summit oh that's the wrong date <laughs> um, i was gonna I say i need to change my flights like, holy cow <laughs> I'm Los like, Angeles. <laughs> I'm like, literally, I was like clicking on something that should have not have been there. There it is. Got the right one there. <laughs> I don't know how that <laughs> happened. Anyway, so that's going to be in October 3rd through the 5th. It's in Dallas, Texas. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about. In fact, I started it 10 years ago because I saw an opportunity to create a, you know, that, that creators that create content, they'd kind of be hit or miss and they didn't really see the full opportunity. I wanted to be able to, to have a place where they could see what the creator economy is and actually treat YouTube like a business, like literally this opportunity is a business. That's why I started uh, Vid Summit. And so, uh, Andrew, I was just wondering if, if you want to, you know, you know, present at Vid Summit. What do you think? Present? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I mean, you're coming, right? <laughs> I you, am coming. Are you coming? Gosh, right. of course. Why right. would I not want who, to present? That's incredible, though. Who, who <laughs> thinks that, that, that Andrew needs to present at Vincent? Put it in the comments here real quick. Wow. We're going to see we're gonna see if they want you to come. Like, I want to come from you. I, like, I, I, I've learned so much. Um, look at this. Here we go. Uh, Mackenzie says, yes. You know, <laughs> let's go. We got a lot of these. I think this is so great. Um, awesome. I, I always find that. Um, the principles, you know, that you're going to learn at Vid Summit, you're going to get uh, golden nuggets, snippets from a lot of different content creators. And sometimes we kind of block out uh, people that we can learn from because they're like, well, they, they're not doing what I do. You know, they're not doing, you know, gaming content or whatever. And so we like to have a variety of different presenters. And so we'd love to learn from you. 
Uh, 100%. Um, so any ideas wow. of what you want to present on? <laughs> Oh gosh, <laughs> I'm still like, I, have, I need to refocus here, Daryl. Um, yeah, I think, I, honestly, I, I guess I will think about it and, and come back to you and we can see yeah. what other people are discussing as well to see uh, where I can bring value. I, I but think... I think maybe just the whole process that people, this is what people are often striving towards. Yeah. And I guess I've been through the content creator's journey, if you will, in a gradual sense. Um, so I can hopefully provide a lot of the lessons that I've learned to people. Um, and also the, the areas that I'm researching and, and kind of honing in now, if you will, as well. Yeah, I, I would love that. I, I think um, for me, there's so many people that, that um, view themselves as a resource channel and would like to actually create, you know, an audience that cares about them more about the content. And, you know, like, think about it. Uh, let's just kind of hit it up quick, because it is literally in less than 60 days. So just to let you know, <laughs> you want to get your ticket. I, I want to tell everybody about I'm going to I'm going to tell you this is the first time ever that we sold hotels out before it even started. So we sold out our third hotel. Um, in Dallas, we, we have uh, these blocks of rooms and all this other stuff. I ain't kidding you. This is like unbelievable. I've never seen it before. And so I would encourage you to get your ticket now, um, you know, at vidsummit.com. Um, let me play a quick video, give you a little uh, hype of what, you know, what the content's about at VidSummit. But when I created it, I wanted, I, I envisioned a time where content creators would come on stage and share what they know, because this is a platform for creators helping creators. And so here you go. <laughs> Coordinating my shoes. 
Vid Summit, man. Like, I, I can't wait for this year for Vid Summit. So um, what we're going to do right now is take some questions for you. And uh, ultimately, uh, let's let's kind of go through this. And then we're going to be giving a couple Vid Summit tickets away. So you definitely want to stick around for that. And um, if anyone actually has a really relevant question uh, for Andrew, go ahead and put it in the comments. For us, it's like, like we really truly want to help you with your YouTube journey. Like at the end of the day, uh, both of us uh, really want to help you in a way that you might have a little bit more clarity or get some validation on a few things. Um, and then two, you're, you're talking to two analytical minds, like we really think in data. And we've seen a lot of data. We've been able to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and ultimately, you know, we, we want to help you. So if you have a, a comment, go ahead and submit that. We'll start out with Death Monkey. <laughs> That's great, great <laughs> handle there. To Judo, how did you find time to get good at your game while making the storytelling content before your editors? Uh, do you have any videos that you would send someone to, uh, to for the best example? Interesting. I would not class myself as being that good at the game anymore. <laughs> like I'm above <laughs> average and I'm pretty good, but I am not on a on a a kind of pro level. So I will say I actually take uh, lessons from a pro at the moment because I need to keep a certain level of of ability in the game, right? Like I can't be terrible at it. But also just think about what your value proposition is. My value proposition is not being a pro at the game. So that is, I don't need to be a pro at the game. Now, to answer your question slightly differently, I was already at a, a good level of the game before I started making content. But I don't play the game that much right now. Certainly not more than I used to because I'm too busy making content, running a business. So in answer to your question, I think it was because I started my channel from an area of passion. So I was already a certain skill level, but it's thinking about what your value proposition is. And I would argue that the, you know, the, the three-star challenge methods that Daryl brought up before, one of the reasons I think they're successful, um, you know, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that I am not a pro at the game. So whatever method that I teach, I have to be able to complete, which means I can't use all of these fancy techniques because I'm not on that level. So in a way, I'm more relatable to a viewer in that sense. So I hope that answers your question. I don't want to no, take that, up that too really much good. time. I've got tons and tons of questions. No, that was that was really good because I think the biggest thing uh, there is knowing what you are and what you're not, right? For so sure. Think of, think of it from a viewer's perspective, Death Monkey. If if he was a pro, he did something. He says, "Oh yeah, he did that because he's a pro. Like he's not like us." And yeah. then what we're we're Andrew's like 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 the uh, a good advanced player. People will say, "Oh look, you know, he's more like us. He's not necessarily a pro." in this regard in fact he's taking lessons from those just so he can stay <laughs> relevant that's great that's that's good content uh from my point of view uh so good good um okay uh the real deals uh there's our boy how do you script a story for an entire video if you don't have the outcome do you focus on the first 30 seconds and potential edit ending or focus during the edit pre-production question mark so you should plan out as much as you can for a video, but certain videos you shouldn't have, you, you know, you shouldn't know the outcome, for especially for gaming content, because you need that authentic, um, you know, reaction and, and what's going to happen. Uh, the If your video is entirely planned out, I would argue that it becomes very stale because you can't, you know, act out in a way that is genuine. So I... For sure, the the intro, the hook, like you're saying, the first 30 seconds, that has to be very carefully planned in terms of what is delivering, what people are clicking on the video for, how am I building curiosity, getting into it, like just providing that value out of the gates. From there, it depends on what the story and what the video is. Some videos are a bit more prepared than others. For example, the educational content, the tip for every level and that sort of, most of that stuff is very well planned out. If I were to build a, a, another video where I beat, uh, you know, let's say I beat the game with a certain twist or I beat all of the, like the single player maps using a certain limitation, 
I, I can't plan that out per se until I get to that stage. But I, I might have a general idea of these are the areas I might start to come into difficulties. What am I going to do if I fail? What am I going to do if, you know, just just planning out those kind of elements, but you can't you can't plan out everything. Yeah, you gotta you gotta be authentic, especially when it comes to stuff like this. And you can pre-plan scenarios. Hey, what happens with this scenario? Okay, we at least thought through the process so that, you know, if it comes out that way or not, you at least pre-thought it out. And so yeah. I would always say definitely look at um, you know, authenticity when it, when, when your content is, needs to be authentic is like, okay, what can we do? What are some scenarios? What are some things that we can add to it? And I think the biggest thing would be, uh, knowing limitations, right? Knowing limitations of you, knowing limitations of the game or, and, or your scenario, uh, is definitely the best. So, uh, yeah. great. We great, were discussing great. this the other day as well, Daryl, of like a video I'm doing right now of beating the game with a certain scenario in seven days. And I was asking Daryl, like, what's the best way to move on if I don't do it in seven days? I'm not going to scrap the whole video, but I need to be able to progress the storyline and, and, you know, keep people engaged at that point, even if I fail the challenge. So there's, yep. you know, there's ways of planning out, but you can't then... You can't plan everything. And we, and we had a good idea, right? We don't need to see what the idea is. <laughs> People really will find out if I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, the, I don't know. This channel is dead. Five bucks. Thank you. I, I hope your channel's really not dead. Question. How can the tactics discussed today for a variety gaming channel, channels not uh, playing a specific game? Well, I think there's a lot of channels that play um, a variety of games. I think it's harder because not everyone plays every specific game. So it's definitely um, a hurdle that you would have to get over. But I would be heavily researching channels that do play a variety of games. And what is it that they do? What's the common thread across those videos? And also, I think, going back to what I was saying before about who's delivering the narrative, and that's me, You before you can do that successfully, you need to understand the processes of content. You need to have gone through the repetition of making content so that you can be confident on camera, charismatic, funny. You can have people like you ultimately at the end right. of the day. That's how you build true retention community, people watching every one of the videos because they like you. Yes, you need to have a good idea, but Think about if Mr. Beast put out a video with a, a, a white screen and no title. It would yep. get millions of views because people have built a community with him. They like him, you know. So, yes, the idea is is one thing, but, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think you need to be yeah. at a certain level to be able to deliver on all of the content across different games, and I'd be researching what the common thread is across yeah, I, I, I like what what, what Andrew said about the common thread is really important. So, like, if is it a uh, what are the similarities between the games? I think if it's like you're going from a mobile game to a desktop game, you know, um, and there's no common thread between the two, like the playing relationship, I think it's going to be a disaster. Um, and the reason why I say that is because you got to get some steam of of audience watching and there needs to be a common thread on it. Now, eventually, when they come for you, you can do whatever the heck you want, um, but it's with, within reason. Right. So I think the, the biggest thing is what is the value proposition? What do they want to see? Um, so I did a review for a channel and they were trying to do a variety of channels and we went in and one of the things I teach my students to do is in analytics to group patterns that you see and, and see, hey, what do we need to do here? Year. Well, we, we saw patterns when they were playing, um, you know, Five Nights at Freddy's and games that would actually get your heart pumping a little bit. Um, you know, that that actually was uh, getting more views than all the other stuff. In fact, people were watching more content. And so I said, hey, you might want to consider doing things around this realm. Um, you know, there's new Five Nights that's coming out. There's new a few things that you're able to do. Let's go ahead and double on that. That, that alone was able to 3x their views, um, just to be a little bit honed in on a niche. It wasn't on a game, it was on kind of the title, not the title of the game, but the, the genre 
um, of, of the game. And so that's something I would always do. And then keep in mind, um, it does come through personality. Uh, like the whole goal should be, hey, do you know what? We want people to watch it, the game for us and not the title. That will give you a lot more longevity. I know that's what uh, Judo has been doing uh, very specifically. It's like, hey, let's really have them want to connect with us. And the extra value that they're getting from it is also the gameplay um, and something that they love to, to, to be around. So I, I would uh, definitely approach it that way for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think Ludwig is a prime example oh my for gosh, me yeah. in that scenario. Yeah, love you know. that. Uh, bridal sewing techniques. Uh, this question is for Daryl. Uh, what questions should we be asking? Is there a question that you wish more people would ask you about? I read your book. I'm going to Vid Summit. Can't wait. Well, congrats on coming to Vid Summit. You're going to really, really enjoy it. Make sure that you say hi. Uh, I'm going to be bouncing around uh, quite a bit, but I love meeting people in person. So definitely do that. Um, for me, the question should be, um, is, and I think that, that, um, the, the common thread of it is, how do I become better? Um, I, I've heard that question before, uh, you know, and people ask, but the, a lot of people don't listen to the priority of what you need to do. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you're not obsessed, obsessed of becoming better, uh, you're going to always be mediocre. Um, I think that you need to have goals and very specific things that you need to do each day to, to improve. And you don't need to improve all at once. It's just a little here, a little there. Um, but it's just that 1%. If you're just improving 1% each time, that's better. And um, I, I would say obsession, like how to, you know, how to become more obsessed. I can't do that. You just have to be obsessed with the passionate side of bringing value to people um, within your niche. But then the obsession of always improving and looking at your data. Um, I can tell you, I, I was watching a content creators channel the other day and how far they've come in three years. Uh, I was looking at their first video and I'm like, man, I wish more content creators would take action that way, become obsessed with be becoming better, not worrying about anyone that's out there. There's no competition. You should only compete with yourself and always try to improve. And when I was looking at their content versus where they started, it, it wasn't even in the same stratosphere. Like, in fact, it wasn't even the same galaxy. You know, it was like totally off, far greater than what it was. And I think that too, and I, I, I would say for you, Andrew, I mean, you can go back and watch those first oh, 100 gosh, videos that you them. made. They're brutal. <laughs> well, I, I think you should always look back on your content. I think there's videos I did, uh, you know, six months ago that I look back on now and I think, oh my gosh, like I could have done this, I could have done that. But if you don't look back on content and, and see what you could have done differently, then you're not growing. You're not moving forward. And that's where, you know, people talk about YouTuber burnout and stuff like that. A lot of that comes down to just not adapting and elevating your content and actually getting better. In my yeah. opinion, but there's there's a whole obviously realm of things that go into that. Yeah, I love it, love it. I, I it is. I, I think it's just the the question should be, you know, what around that. I I, I mean, realistically, to to sum up uh, YouTube in in short. Um, it, it needs to be clickable, whatever your title thumbnail needs to be clickable and you need to be obsessed of making better clickable content and then fulfilling on the, the value of the title and thumbnail is, is key, but doing something where there's a shareable moment where they want to go deeper with you. I mean, that's the most simple way to succeed on YouTube. I don't think people are critical enough with their content, uh, to do that. I think they just say, Oh, this is a great, I, I want to. I want to be surrounded by people that watched their video that they uploaded last month and said, that was like horrible. I could have done this, 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 this better. Um, and always are on, on, on the quest to improve because I think when they do that, they're critical of themselves, not in the sense that it brings down their mental health, but it energizes them. I, I, I could do so much better, you know, and they, they celebrate in that. And I think that's where it all comes in. Okay. Gabe. Judo, Daryl, what are some of the most overlooked but effective methods in finding your avatar? Excited to connect to VidSummit this year. So what would you tell Gabe? Um, in finding your avatar, I think... Um, I, 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 I would want to say... What I was discussing earlier about making assumptions based on character traits of the avatar, because I think you can be trying to look at data all of the time and not actually have a holistic view of 
of what you're making content for that person for. Because the best content, in my opinion, is the content you need, but you didn't know that you needed. Yep. You know, if you if if I told Mr. Beast what video to make and what I expected, it it probably wouldn't be as good as if you know he just makes the video that he knows is kind of two steps ahead of us. So. I don't know if you have a different answer, Daryl, but I, I would say probably the assumptions based on once you have data and you have a good um, avatar, trying to build out what their character traits are and what they're interested in without actually having data to go off, if that makes yeah. sense. You got to you gotta start with an assumption. Like, I assume that this is the type of people watching this. One of the things that I'm um, probably obsessive over is knowing what people watch. When I ever meet anyone that's alpha or Gen Z or even millennial, I'm like, hey, what YouTube channels do you watch? Because that literally tells me a lot about who they are and also gives me some context. And, and two, once I understand it, then it's more, okay, there's some commonalities between it. And so I think asking questions, but also following specific channels. And then um, part, of, part of it is too, is just like, um, seeing what's being recommended based off of that. You're starting to see mm. some relationship between the views. Now, you might have an assumption that there's certain, you know, a certain uh, age and, you know, demographic or whatever. But what we care about mostly is the psychographics. Why are they watching? What value are they receiving? And why do they cons consistently come back? And I think if you do that, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. And then two, having at least a good assumption of what it is and then try to validate it. One of the best way to, validates, uh, to validate is to have interactions in your videos. Like literally have conversations with them and have them put it in the comments. That's ways to, for you to do it. Uh, one of the funny things about it is I was with uh, an inner circle uh, student of mine um, that's where they came to my house and we'd kind of strategize. And I'm like, where do you feel like your, your viewers are watching your content? And we looked very specifically, the number one traffic source was actually mobile. And number two was TV. And I'm like, tell me, tell me where the people on mobile device are watching it. And he goes, honestly, I think that they're actually on a bathroom break watching a video. I'm like, are you serious? Are you really think that? He goes, yeah, I, I just, I, I instinctually think that that's happening. I'm like, okay, let's, let's find out. Believe it or not, he did a survey and it was like 40% of the people that were watching it was doing it on the John. And it's just like, <laughs> come on now, man. But I, I think it's just like, Gabe, all you got to do is like have these, these ideas of who, where they're watching it, what they're watching it from, what value are they coming, have those assumptions and start validating it through your content. And if you don't have any, any views, you can validate it through the other videos that you feel like they would appeal to. I think that's really, really big um, and huge. Okay. Oh, look at this. Hope scope. Um, Hope's asking tips on interacting with cool, successful content creators for, for those of us who feel socially awkward. What do you think? <laughs> it, so the question is, if I understand it correctly, talking with other creators, not... Is that how you read that? Yeah, I think it's like how do you how how do you interact with other content creators? Um, how do you collab? Um, I I want to I want to just state this. Um, I this is an observation, a pattern that I've been able to see. Um, I have found that most successful YouTubers are introverts. It's true. They would rather be in their room making videos than out in front of you know millions of people. I just, they are, they're just like literally that. Um, the, one of the biggest introverts of, of my life is Mr. Beast. Like he is so, he'd rather, you know, be away from people, but I think it gives them an outlet to connect. But um, I'll answer this one. Um, I, I think uh, when, when I'm raising kids and when we're around very famous people and stuff like that, I want them to treat them as normal people. Um, I think that's number one. I think that's really, really important. They're not to elevate them by no means, but have them have that, that interaction. I think other content creators want to have normal conversations too. You know, um, mm. now they want to be strategic and they want to make sense. And I think the big thing is, um, you know, for me, it's always can, and this is something that I uh, live by, can I bring value in our conversations? Can I help them? in any way, I'm going to just do it. Even if it's giving them ideas or just listening to them or helping them go through some struggle, whatever that may be. Um, but I, I would say that is, is key. And then, um, more so 
don't have an agenda. Um, I think mm -hmm. um, people says, here's my shot. I see Hope Scope at Vid Summit. I'm going to give her my elevator pitch instead of just chilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think um, Khan and Samia did a very good, uh, dis had a very good discussion on this topic, actually on their creator support channel. I can just yep. DM you that uh, episode if you didn't see it, Hope. But they, they went into a lot of uh, stuff that you discussed there, Daryl. I think context is very important. Like where, where is this person? Are, are, yep. are you at Vid Summit where your those discussions could happen? Or are they leaving a coffee shop? And that's a very different scenario sort of thing. Yeah, um, no, agreed, agreed. And I think, I think too, it's, I think there's a time to talk business, a time uh, to relate. I think a lot of people want to relate. Um, uh -huh. But I, I, I do believe, though, um, some of the most socially awkward people are some of the top YouTubers on, on the planet. There's some that are not, some do like thrive off of that. But the ones that I look for is the ones that are like, like uh, reserved. Um, in fact, Hope, you know, you and I were at an event um, in L.A. And, um, you know, I, I was looking at a, a YouTuber, uh, um, TikToker that, that gets like three billion video views a month. And and he wasn't the star of the show. Like he was just kind of, you know, back against the wall, hiding from everybody, you know, and I just approached him and just say, hey, you know what? He's like, oh yeah, you know, thanks for that consult. Cause I, we met, you know, a few years ago. And, you know, I just wanted to see how he was doing, you know, at the end of the day. And then for me, it was introducing him to somebody and it kind of opened up that, that opportunity. But um, I do believe this, it's like the more that you can bring value to someone, mm -hmm. uh, the more you can be a listening ear, the more opportunities that uh, will be presented for sure so all right um let's go on to some more how, how are you doing on time are you okay i'm okay i, I kind of booked out the a good number of hours so okay i great. think it's important that we get everyone's questions done yeah kenny joe what is your advice for pivoting outside of your current niche into other game tiles with the same developer hey what's up kenny um i wow okay so I would th first be looking at what we were discussing before, the common thread between Clash of Clans, because Kenny's a Clash of Clans creator, and what are the games that it is that you're trying to make. Clash titles are a, a, an, an easy way to kind of pivot across. Um, let's say you were making a hard pivot to Brawl Stars, which is it's still within the same game genre, so I think it's a lot easier than going to a totally different um, game. But I would be thinking about how can I not make a hard pivot which alienates my audience? Because that is not what you want to do, obviously. How can I gradually bring them across this journey? So what type of things would appeal to Clash of Clans, but also those Brawl Stars people? So I can give you an example. I was invited to the Brawl Stars World Championships, and I wanted to make a video on that because I wanted to improve on my in-real-life uh, content. It's a kind of a skill I don't get to do in this scenario, scenario the, the, bring, the stuff that I break. So I thought, how do I obviously appeal to my viewers at the end of the day if it's a Brawl Stars event? So I went as a Clash of Clans fan, infiltrating the event was the storyline, and it was all, you know, tying in. And Brawl Stars fans would love it as well, because it was that kind of pitching off each other. Who's the best game? Like, can Clash of Clans, you know, infiltrate Brawl Stars? So you're, you're kind of tapping into both audiences. You could do things like uh, five ideas that should be, you know, that Clash of Clans could implement from Brawl Stars. That would appeal to kind of Brawl Stars viewers as well, and you're still appealing to Clash of Clans. So I would be looking at how can you gradually pivot across in that manner rather than, you know, just making a hard pivot, if that makes sense, which I, I mean, you're a smart guy. You definitely weren't going to do that anyway, but that's how I would be going about it. Like, is there a common thread? Is there a way that I can appeal to kind of both audiences, gradually appeal to a bigger subset of the other games audience, a bit like what I did when I was search and I was transitioning across to kind of uh, browse content and more entertainment. I couldn't just hard pivot from educational to entertainment, but I was kind of peppering in that content as I went in order to gradually make that transition. So I love that's that. exactly what I would do. All right. So this one is, um, okay. Even if I apply all these lessons, what do you do if the top creator from your niche prevents you from being seen? Judo owns clash niche. So it's getting hard. It, so it's getting seen is very hard. 
So like what, what, what happens when someone's dominating like everything and how do you stand out would be the question. Okay. I think you can, there's a number of things here. I think you have to be objective with yourself, with where you are. And it is very, it's hard not to compare yourself with others. It's very, it's, it's something that we always say, but it's very hard not to do. I'll be completely honest about that. So I would be trying your best not to compare your content with mine. Have an objective look as to where you are, what you need to improve, but what value can you bring that nobody else is bringing? How are you going to break out of the mold? And you could actually, if you want data to support that, go and have a look at other niche. Go and have a look at Minecraft. Like Dream just exploded, right? Like Minecraft was oversaturated back then too. And I, I know there's other creators since then that have broke in and, and, you know, pushed up. So you're not going to and I don't mean you to take this in the wrong way, but you're not going to get to the top doing the same thing that someone at the top Everybody is already is doing. doing. So like, how, how are you going to overtake if that is the same, you know, if you're following the same path, you need to find out what your value is, how you can deliver that. And then, you know, so break out me, in that manner. Yeah. Let me, let me further validate what, what Andrew just said uh, for you, Cammy. like, um, you got to figure out what your value proposition is. And uh, believe it or not, we have two uh, YouTubers that are coming. They're both gamers. They're both playing Minecraft and they're actually presenting and their title. Let me let me pull up, even though that we're doing this giveaway for Vid Summit real quick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up their title because I think it's it's actually really important for you to see what type of presentations actually happen because it's so relevant uh, to what you're saying. So here's here's their session right here. Um, it's breaking through the noise, dominating an oversaturated niche on YouTube, and it's Nico and Cash. I'm here to tell you, man. Um, I when I saw Cash like literally start popping off, like he did it within six months, and he well actually it was, it was 30 days, and then it went to six months, whatever. But in in the last nine months, he gained 5.6 million subscribers, and almost wow. he's getting close to a billion views. And what what he did was he found what he's passionate about. He found his niche, and and he was providing value consistently on that. And so, um, you know, what he was able to do is is create content in a storytelling way that has never been done before. Uh, you know, is very creative and engaging. And these are like sometimes thirty minute videos, and and there's so much watch time and so on. It's just so great. So anyway, love the, the other thing. But. Yeah, the other thing I would say to expand as well is uh, don't expect things too soon because you can lead yourself into disappointment. I've been on YouTube for eight years, over eight years at this point, and I've been actively improving on what I do to, to get where I am now. So if I, I don't know your situation, sorry, but it, let's say you're only six months into your journey. It's a little bit unrealistic to think that you would be able to just instantly pop to that top level. I think just setting yourself goals and competing with yourself, the incremental improvements that we've been talking about, that's the way to do it. And eventually, because there was a point where I was nowhere in the clash scene, you yeah. know, and, and I've kind of kept going and kept improving. And I think that's, that's important to mention as well is yeah, to not it. set yourself too high of expectations. So this is what we're going to do. Um, if you want a ticket to VidSummit, go ahead and just put hashtag VidSummit, hashtag VidSummit. You only need to do it once. And if you already have a ticket, it doesn't, you don't get to do it. You actually get to bring someone. Uh, you don't get to cash it in and, and go from there. For us, you know, it's more about the giving it away. If you don't have a ticket, you get to come on this one. So I'm going to give you just a minute or two uh, to put that in. Uh, so if you want to come to VidSummit, go ahead and put hashtag VidSummit. One of the things that we're doing here at VidSummit, I want to, I want to just show you really quickly, um, the kind of, kind of the schedule and, uh, things that we're doing at VidSummit. This is the first time that we're actually at a different location. We've been in LA, um, the whole time, uh, all nine years and our 10th year, we're going to be in Texas. And uh, we did that for multiple reasons. We grew out of the facility that we actually were at and, and ultimately, uh, we are at a new facility 
and it is amazing. We have some of the biggest content creators on the planet coming together and willing to share with you all the things that they wish they would have known. Uh, some of these are really exciting. I'm really excited that we have Mr. Beast back. He's our partner at Vid Summit for sure. We have Michelle. Michelle's crushing it. I wanted to get her last year, uh, but she was willing to give us uh, you know time this year. She's bringing her team. Uh, I am so excited, ecstatic to have her. She's probably one of the best storytellers, I believe, on YouTube today. And then, of course, we have Zach King. And then we have Fat Man McGee here, Daryl here, and uh, also Shunderous. But we also have Mindy McKnight. Um, I've been really inspired with Mindy uh, for all these different years. Believe it or not, Mindy's husband presented at Vid Summit 1. And it's it's actually uh, awesome to have them at Vid Summit 10 because like they've come a long ways in the 10 years and she's built a very massive brand outside of YouTube from her YouTube presence. Uh, we actually have Preston coming and he's kicking off the Vid Summit. He's talking about how to scale from zero uh, on up, building a team. And then we have Jenny. I am so excited to have Jenny because she came to Vid Summit and uh, was able to use her last dollars in her bank account to come. And now uh, she's actually keynoting because uh, she is just smashing YouTube in so many different ways. And then we have so many other speakers, but ultimately you can see that uh, we, we have a schedule on here. I'm adding a few more. We'll be adding Andrew to the schedule here. We actually have Renee, Renee Ritchie from uh, YouTube that's talking about the next chapter of YouTube. You definitely don't want to miss that. And ultimately, we have a lot of content. There's a lot of great sessions. You don't want to miss it. Now, here's the thing that, that's going to happen um, is we are always going to have replays. You're going to be able to have those replays for sure. But you'll definitely not want to miss this year's Vid Summit if you can come in person. Um, I, I'm, I'm telling you, there's certain things that you can only get at the at Vid Summit in person. And, and I'm telling you, uh, if you have the ability, I would make it happen. In fact, we're going to give a ticket away uh, to someone that um, might want to come. You know, so let me <laughs> go ahead. So all you got to do is put Vid Summit in the uh the chat we'll wait for one more so we have 100 and then we'll go ahead and submit so we basically have a lucky winner 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 let's see what this this who's going to actually come and the winner is coiny coiny you are coming to vid summit now if you already have a ticket that's okay. We'll get you a plus one. This will be your plus one. Uh, all you need to do is DM me on Twitter or X or, or Instagram. I'll go ahead and get that information out to you. Make sure you put the time code here because my team uh, validates that. But congratulations, you're going to win a ticket. And um, yeah, you want a ticket. There you go. So should we, should we do another one? I think we should do another Why one. Why not? Let's do it. Sick. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks to StreamYard here. They're also a sponsor of Vid Summit. We love StreamYard and all their fun tools. Fun, fa uh, fun fam, you are coming to Vid Summit. There you go. You just won a ticket to Vid Summit uh, worth $1,000, which is super, super, super amazing. Uh, okay. So what we're going to do is take a couple more questions and and then we'll kind of give away one last ticket i'll just do it by people that have been commenting i think that's another relevant way to give a ticket uh, but yep. let's kind of dive right in and answer a couple more questions um, um here we go um we did the pivoting question right mm -hmm. okay yep. okay here we go the crypto channel. I want to change niches from crypto to oil painting tutorials. How should I do this? Please consider giving me a, a way of mentorship course. Thank you for inspiring us as content creators. Okay, so um, wow. Uh, believe it or not, we actually have a session um, from Kimberlea. Uh, that she took her channel from a pop socket channel to a um, uh, true crimes channel. And the, the question is going to be, are you getting traffic right now that care for you? Uh, or is it more for the subject? So you can find that by, you know, the comments that's coming in and so on. If you're not necessarily getting the views that you are normally getting and you want to do it, you can do what Kimberlea did because she had a choice. 
do the same channel or 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 pivot. Um, she was actually using uh, her name and some things that are associated with it. So that was kind of like the hesitancy for that as well. And that's the reason why she just used her same channel. Where you're the crypto channel, I think if you change it to painting tutorials, when anyone that was watching a crypto video would see a painting tutorial, I don't know if they would actually click on it. And if they can't click on it, then you're actually losing out on that opportunity. And so, however, um, if it's a paint oil painting tutorial and you're doing it as an NFT, maybe, maybe there's some interest. I don't know. Um, I, I, I would probably just start a brand new channel and be consistent with oil painting tutorials if it was me and maybe push some traffic with your community tab saying, Hey, if you're interested in oil, you know, oil painting, I'm over here. Uh, but ultimately it's kind of hard. If it's a different audience, it should be a different channel. That pivot is, is, is difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. Kimberlea uh, proved it. And that's what she's actually presenting on at uh, vid summit. So any, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just going to say it purely comes down to the, the status of your channel right now and whether it is worth kind of persisting with that or just, just kind of starting fresh. And I think it comes down to, like Daryl said, how many people are, are there? Are there ways that you can kind of soft pivot over slightly where you can slowly appeal to people and just bring them across on that journey? If you do not follow Todd on Twitter, I would highly recommend Definitely it because he actually did a Q&A last week and someone asked him this exact answer uh, or this exact this question. question sorry. So I would go and um, I would go and have a look at his Twitter. Yep. Yep. Very good. Very good. OK, so let me do this one. How does Andrew strategize shorts in his storytelling strategy? Shorts as in short content. So yeah, sh short form. Yep. I basically I think, again, it comes down to the idea. Is the idea, you know, able to be a, a long form piece? But one thing that I, I think people underestimate is being able to use shorts to test for your long form content as well. So in, in terms of strategizing your shorts, are they, they follow the same principles. They're just a lot shorter, right? Like you need to be able to deliver instantly. Whereas in the long form, I enjoy being able to get into the story a bit deeper into the meat of things and connecting with your viewer more. But in terms of shorts, you can use them as well to get better at your intros, um, test out certain uh, viral shareable moments that you want to perhaps pepper into your content. There's a lot of different ways that you can use shorts to help elevate your channel, obviously, um, but also to test for your long form content. Yeah, I hope I love that it. answers your question. Yeah, love it. All right, so what we're going to do now is this comment. Um, so, uh, Rayon, um, I'd love for you to come to Vid Summit. I think, you know, coming from Jordan, that's I I've, I've flew. In fact, after Vid Summit, I'm actually flying to your country. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got to do some work there for a couple months. And so, um, you know, I know how long that flight is, and I know how costly that flight is. So guess what, man? It looks like I'm going to get you a ticket. And the real bills will fly you. Awesome. <laughs> there you go, man. Like, like that doesn't get much better than that. So uh, all you need to do is DM me on uh, Twitter uh, or X or whatever they call it nowadays, and uh, we'll get you taken care of. And we're excited. I, I've seen you were active uh, in the conversations to today. So it, um, basically, uh, Andrew, any last thoughts, any words of wisdom as we, as we finish up? Um, I would, I would say to continue being open-minded on what it is that you are learning make sure that you are deliberate with what you're doing in terms of your content but also your your learning process and your strategizing applying that knowledge as best as possible it's just, you know you can't apply everything so being able to be do that in stages so you're making that gradual increase trying to get feedback give feedback um and there's a lot of things that do just take time i hate to, to to kind of continue to reiterate that but i think that many people can expect things to happen too quickly and you know like camera presence being able to like i was talking before about likability and that sort of things just comes with time 
And that's why people say just make content. You can analyze everything, and but then you just get a bit of a sixth sense on things. Like I was talking about, I feel um, I used to, and a lot of people can fall into the trap of putting too much context in the video without kind of peppering context as you move through and progressing the storyline. That's the sort of things that just come with practice. For myself, I feel one thing that used to hold me back actually was my accent. And I don't mean that in the sense of people have accents. Your accent is not going to stop you. But if you are hard to understand, then you can you can limit your reach, essentially. So that is one thing that took a long time for me to be able to be more articulate, pronounce my words more. And I think just being more deliberate around the avatar. If you've watched any of my content, I know there's a couple of Clash people here. I have been a lot different in this interview than I am with my content. That's exactly the right. The pacing of my voice, the uh, tone, the exactly what I said. It's so different because I'm talking to a different person. So I think just being, being open-minded to learn, apply that knowledge, constantly seeking for more knowledge, and just setting yourself goals, being able to understand that things will take time and put the work in. I, I one, one little thing that I will leave people on then, I think a, a lot of times people do a lot of research, analysts, uh, um, Analysis paralysis, you call it, Daryl. And I think a good a good way of explaining this is I've had cre creators reach out to me before, and a lot of my advice has been just make content. Take those principles, but make content. And if you want to become a high-level athlete, let's say, it's important you understand what exercises to do, what, what your diet should be. If you're competing against somebody, you need to research that person. But ultimately, you need to go to the gym. So you need to be creating content. And I think I would leave people with that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So uh, I, I think the biggest thing more than anything else is take action, um, be set to improve, um, be hypercritical of the value that you're bringing. Don't, don't make it become just second nature to you. Just always push the envelope to be better and be on a journey, um, you know, be on a journey to always improve even if it's just one percent so that's kind of where it's all about and then i i just know that people that hyper obsess of becoming better and really don't worry about the competition uh, they use it as data input to understand the viewer better but look at their own content and try to make that better that's where it can all uh you know really expand and grow and so uh guys thank you so much for jumping on andrew thank you so much for taking well over two hours and and bringing value hopefully everyone here was really uplifted and encouraged uh, to analyze, analyze and um, you know really adjust some of the things that they might have brought value in. You brought value to them in uh, this live stream. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll see everybody on the next one. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Take care.